they use this to pay off some of the OTC derivatives transactions, and they get a commitment from these banks to continue to supply capital to LTCM so they, they could get past this rough patch. Sure enough, over time, uh, LTCM loses their entire investment. They're found to have lost $4.6 billion. But because of the intervention and the capability to continue to float their OTC derivatives transactions and their bond transactions, they don't close their doors. They're able to stay uh, open. The banks are able to recoup some of their investments. And today, uh, a lot of their concepts that had been set forth back in 1994 have proven themselves and uh, proven themselves quite well. Uh, they have stopped bleeding money and have succeeded in profiting some. But as you can see, this is a transaction that happened not only in the exchange traded market, it also happened on the over-the-counter market. And when you look at that, it's, it's just absolutely wild at the amount of leverage that this company was allowed to have. And you as a, as a speculative investor, you'll start to see the amount of leverage that you'll be able to command in the over-the-counter market, and you'll see that it's, just, it's practically uh, the same amount or the same proportion uh, to your investments as well. Now let's look at the Hungarian uh, currency fiasco. This is a prime example of what I said in the beginning, how there are so many more exciting opportunities available in the currency markets. As many of you know, uh, there are a lot of Eastern European countries that are being included into the European Union. And as part of their agreement to join the European Union, they are forced to do about three different things. One, they have to have a solid balance sheet uh, showing that uh, they've got proper uh, gross domestic, domestic product, proper uh, imports and exports, and that the Treasury is not over uh, lent out and that they're uh, you know, there's a strong or decent economy enough to fit into the European Union. Uh, they also have to show that they're no longer uh, creating any more capital or any more cash in their economy, that they're actually preparing to join the European Union. And lastly, they have to give up their currency. And they have to give these currencies up at fixed rates that they agree upon with the European Union. If they do not give their currencies up at these particular rates, then they'll have a difficult time entering the European Union, if not a serious delay. Well, we see this happen in Hungary. Hungary uh, was slated for uh, joining the European Union uh, a few years back, and one of the requirements that the European Union had for them was to have 276 uh, forints, which is the name of their currency, uh, to one European Union currency. And that was the fixed rate that they needed in order to join the European Union. Well, that wasn't happening. Many small banks in, uh, throughout Europe decided that they were going to speculate on the Hungarian currency. And they were going to speculate that the Hungarian currency was going to get stronger as the time got closer for Hungary to join the European Union. And in this speculation, they began to buy up Hungarian bonds. This was devastating to the value of the currency. It went from 276 Euro, uh, Hungarian forints to one European currency, all the way down to 234 uh, forints to one European currency. And if you have noticed lately uh, with what's going on with the Japanese, a strong currency is definitely a detriment to a country that is trying to reach uh, more exports, that is trying to join uh, the import-export world at all. A strong currency actually can be a huge setback in any of their growth. And this is what was happening in Hungary. They saw immediately that these speculators had created a situation that, number one, jeopardized their joining the European Union, and number two, through all of their facts and figures, it went presenting to the European Union off, and it created just a lot of problems for them. And the European, uh, there were the Hungarian, the European Union demanded that they put the currency in check. So the Hungarian Central Bank decided to make a move. Uh, they decided that they were going to sh make sure that the, Euro the Hungarian foreign would reach the level it was supposed to in order for them to join. Now, as we saw, uh, 
in the last discussion about the Bank of England and how we tried to do the same thing against George Soros, not always do central banks succeed in fulfilling their objectives. But this time, the Hungarian central bank succeeded. They went out and made a huge move. They decided to slash interest rates aggressively. Uh, they initially slashed interest rates of, to a quarter percent. That didn't slow it down. They then did, they then did a, uh, a full percentage. That didn't slow it down. Eventually, they slashed the rates that they were paying on their bonds by several percentage points, and it immediately halted the speculators buying Hungarian bonds. And of course, they found themselves, the speculators found themselves uh, in a bad situation where their bonds weren't yielding as much as they expected, and they began to sell the bonds, which was what Hungary wanted in the first place. And then Hungary did it several other things, such as uh, selling uh, Hungarian foreigns into the OTC cash market, and it began to create uh, a situation where they found equilibrium in their currency. Now, to the speculators, this was, was horrendous. A lot of the money that they had built up had just come tumbling down in a market that no longer wanted Hungarian foreigns at all, and many of them lost out. One of the major losers in this was uh, Deutsche Bank, who uh, lost $200 million, uh, in one pop against the Hungari Hungarian uh, foreign uh, fiasco. So while this was a success for Hungary's central bank economy, this was a huge uh, downturn for the speculators. And us as small speculators, we have to be very keen at what the central banks of foreign currencies are doing when we're trading them. Many of the opportunities to succeed and to profit will not always be in trading just the European uh, currency against the dollar or trading the Japanese yen or trading the Swiss franc. A lot of the success and profits will come from trading currencies like the Hungarian uh, foreign that are about to trade over or change into uh, the European Union. Uh, last year I spent a lot of time in Romania and uh, Romania is slated to join the European Union in 2007 and I'm quite sure the Romanian Leu will have a lot of the exact same trading opportunities that Hungary had before joining. Uh, so look out for obscure opportunities like that in order for you to trade and make profits. Now we'll broach the subject of the fundamentals of foreign exchange. I hope that uh, you learned a lot from the different anecdotes that I brought up and it got your mind to thinking about what you are capable of doing in the foreign currency markets. Uh, there's a lot of leverage opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities to uh, trade uh, obscure currencies. And there's a lot of uh, just things to do uh, with technical analysis and understanding how currencies operate. So what we're going to do now is break down the various fundamentals of foreign exchange because foreign exchange is not traded uh, in just one way. Here's the core definition of foreign exchange uh, that I've plucked out of the American Heritage Dictionary. And it has two items. The first one is transaction of international monetary business as between governments or businesses of different countries. As we spoke about, a large player in all of foreign currency exchange are central banks of foreign currencies. And the next definition is negotiable bills drawn in one country to be paid in another country. This is great. Foreign currency exchange is not limited to just currencies themselves. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are bond opportunities, uh, there are option opportunities, sometimes there are even stock opportunities. So any permutation where you're able to trade uh, one of these items, uh, whether they're bonds, options, uh, or the stock market, you're in a foreign country, you're participating in foreign exchange. In this particular seminar, we're just simply going to focus on the foreign currency market uh, because most people are easy to, it's easy to understand and most people are familiar with a lot of the advertisements going on. But don't limit yourself to just foreign currencies when you're looking at investing in uh, foreign exchange. Now, there are several ways to view foreign exchange. Uh, some people have the idea that when you trade foreign exchange, uh, you really trade that you're really trading the country's intrinsic value and that every country's intrinsic value is represented in the actual movements of its currencies. 